Hello and welcome to our next lecture on physiological psychology. We'll be talking about sexual behavior in the brain. This is the last of our uh, lectures in this area on um, sex in the brain. So we've talked already about reproductive hormones, re reproductive hormones and cognition, and a little bit about sex and gender. <coughs> Excuse me. So today we're going to talk a little bit about some parts of the brain associated with sex. And in particular, we'll talk a bit about uh, the relationship uh, between physiology and sexual orientation. So sex hormones early in life, of course, influence development in the hypothalamus, amygdala, and other brain areas. Uh, these are things that we have uh, discussed uh, a number of times already in terms of their organizational and activational effects. Of course, they produce anatomical and physiological differences. In particular, there's a part of the brain we call the sexually dimorphic nucleus, which is an area in the anterior hypothalamus. Uh, this area tends to be larger in males and seems to have um, some contribution to the control of male sexual behavior. And so this is an area that people look at to look at uh, differences between males and females in terms of uh, sexual behavior and how that expresses itself. In particular, oftentimes we look in this area in uh, looking at animal behavior, uh, mating rituals, this sort of thing. But in humans, we do see uh, this anterior hypothalamus is indeed larger in males. <coughs> so the brain, of course, is uh, responsible for controlling most of our sexual arousal. Uh, males, uh, in particular, uh, are influenced by testosterone. So increasing uh, testosterone levels increases touch sensitivity uh, in the penis, so uh, this is associated with feelings of sexual pleasure. Uh, sex hormones bind to receptors in the hypothalamus, including the ventromedial nucleus, the medial preoptic area, and the anterior hypothalamus. So these are areas in which we would expect uh, sex hormones to have behavioral effects. We also know that testosterone triggers the release of dopamine by the medial preoptic area and other areas, and this can then be associated with feelings of reward. Uh, our next lecture is actually going to be on the reward pathway. And we certainly know that sex is one of the um, things that we find very rewarding, most of us, uh, and it's certainly a big part of sexual behavior, and that is related to this release of dopamine. <coughs> um, and that's not to say that, that this is uh, testosterone uh, and its release is associated entirely with feelings of reward, because certainly women have. Uh, feelings of reward from sex as well, and some of that also seems to potentially be mediated by testosterone, but certainly by dopamine. Uh, testosterone levels correlate positively with sexual arousal and the drive to seek sexual partners, uh, and this uh, certainly is true in males, and there is uh, emerging evidence that this may be also true in females, that women with very, very low levels of testosterone may actually have lower sex drive. And so there's some ongoing research uh, in this area uh, particularly for women who are concerned about low sex drive, uh, may want to seek some sort of medical treatment. Uh, these are areas in which there is ongoing research. One of the things I want to make very clear is there is a wide array of what people want from their sex lives and whether or not they're even concerned at all about having low sex drive. The important consideration in this area is always if it's not bothering you, then it's perfectly fine. But if it's something that you're concerned about, then you should certainly think about um, having uh, a conversation with your doctor. Uh, so th there's a wide variety of <coughs> sexual behaviors, all of which are uh, perfectly uh, normal and fine. Uh, we do know uh, that married men or those in committed relationships tend to have lower testosterone levels. And this may have uh, some implications for sexual fidelity and uh, reductions in um, some perceived reductions or potential reductions in uh, the amount of sex that people have once they're in committed relationships. Uh, high, high testosterone levels tend to result in greater than average desire to seek additional sex partners, even if in a committed relationship. So this may be an area in which um, biology may be somewhat overriding our social um, responsibilities or our social beliefs uh, because those high testosterone levels uh, create a greater desire for additional sexual partners. So there's certainly relationships between uh, circulating and hormone levels and sexual behavior. <coughs> um, in terms of the effects of neurotransmitters, 
uh, dopamine stimulation of both uh, D1 and D5 receptors is associated with sexual arousal. This facilitates erection of the penis and sexual receptivity response in females. So as I said before, dopamine is a really important part of this question. Uh, in my human sexuality classes and my drugs and human behavior classes, we talk often about how some recreational drugs like cocaine, amphetamines, alter our sexual arousal and desire for sex. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Uh, higher concentrations of dopamine then stimulate the D2 receptors, and this is what leads to orgasm in both males and females. Um, <coughs> one of the things I want to note before I move on is uh, there is a lot of um, unfortunate um, sexism in this research. In fact, male sexual behavior has oftentimes been studied a great deal more than female sexual behavior. And so uh, it's something to be mindful of when you're looking in the literature, that there's a lot of catching up we have to do, and particularly in understanding sexual responses uh, in women. Uh, so continuing on, the neurotransmitter serotonin decreases sexual activity by blocking dopamine release. Um, one of the things I want to note about this is this can be particularly problematic for people who are being treated with antidepressants. So antidepressants like Paxil or Zoloft <coughs> or Lexapro um, increase serotonin uh, availability, availability by blocking its reuptake into the presynaptic uh, neuron. And as a result, you can get uh, decreases in interest in sexual activity. Uh, some males have erectile uh, difficulty or difficulty orgasming. Um, so it's something to be mindful of when getting treated for depression. Uh, it may be that you want to switch medications or add a second medication. Uh, so sometimes people will add uh, an erectile dysfunction drug so that they don't have any erectile difficulties. Uh, because certainly um, a lot of people will be unhappy <laughs> that their depression may be lifting, but now they're no longer interested in sex, which then makes them further depressed. So these are really complex issues to think about. Uh, so that's a little bit about um, the brain and sex. We'll talk about the um, reward pathway and how all things that are rewarding uh, are involved in our next lecture. I want to finish up talking today <coughs> not, excuse me, uh, about sexual orientation. So uh, the first question people often have about sexual orientation is uh, genetics. Is, is uh, homosexuality, bisexuality, alternative sexuality, is it somehow genetically controlled? It is potentially a contributing factor in sexual orientation. One of the things that's really important to realize is that being genetic is not the only potential biological cause or natural cause. Genetics is one part of the picture, uh, as we've seen when we talked uh, previously about sex and gender. So if we look at research studies involving twins, if uh, one twin is homosexual, the probability that the other twin is homosexual is fairly high. And this is for monozygotic twins or identical twins that share um, the same uh, genotype. It's lower fi for fraternal or dizygotic twins because, again, they have uh, less genetic similarity. So there is evidence that there is a genetic component, but certainly no singular, single particular gene has been identified. And I'm not really sure there's that much interest in even finding that particular gene. Uh, most people's interest in this is understanding this is a natural phenomenon, uh, not anything that needs to be cured or prevented, but simply understood as part of uh, our natural development. <coughs> so it's unlikely that any gene on the X chromosome plays a major role, um, and so it's probably uh, somewhere else. So if we look at twin concordance for homosexuality, uh, in the green bars, we have the percentage concordance, which is the percentage of uh, identical twins where one is twin and or one twin is gay. If they're concordant, then the other twin is also gay or vice versa. Um, and so you can see a great more concordance in sexual orientation in monozygotic twins compared to dizygotic twins, particularly in the United States. Um, why it's different in Sweden is kind of an open question. Uh, it may have to do with the way the data is collected. Um, or just simply in differences in overall um, background rates for sexual orientation. <coughs> um, 
One of the things we have seen is there are differences in brain structures. This is some of the earliest research in this area. Uh, researcher by the name of Simon LeVay did a very um, groundbreaking study back in the uh, early 90s. And what LeVay found is uh, he found differences in hypothalamic structure size based on sexual orientation. Um, one of the problems with LeVay's data is uh, the uh, brains that he had access to were um, all individuals who had died from uh, complications resulting from AIDS. Uh, keep in mind that in the late 80s and early 90s, we did not really have access to um, any way to image something like the hypothalamus uh, except for post-mortem. And so m these studies are all post-mortem. <coughs> Excuse me. In more recent uh, fMRI research, we see differences in uh, amygdala and brain symmetry based on sexual orientation. And so uh, observing some uh, underlying brain differences in uh, heterosexual and homosexual individuals, uh, again, starts to argue uh, in the uh, notion that this is a natural phenomenon. Some interesting uh, other ways in which sexual orientation uh, is illustrated uh, in basic biological phenomenon. Uh, gays and lesbians are more likely to be left-handed. Uh, gays and lesbians have different 2D, 4D uh, finger length ratios. And so if you look here, this is the second digit and the fourth digit. And the ratio from the second digit to the fourth digit is an important indicator of exposure to prenatal androgen levels. So the reason why this research was um, started was this is a biological marker of prenatal androgen level levels. In men, uh, the index finger, so the second digit, is often shorter than the fourth digit. In women, they tend to be more similar in length. Uh, lesbians have tend to have digit ratios sort of in between men and women. And there is some evidence that gay males have a more masculinized digit ratio, so even more extreme uh, digit ratio, so a uh, much shorter index finger compared to <coughs> the uh, fourth digit. Now, what's interesting about this is this relates to what's called the older brother hypothesis. The more older brothers a man has, the more likely he is to be gay. Uh, and what happens is, is that each male offspring results in altered androgen levels. One of the things that's very strange about um, pregnancy is every pregnancy changes the mother in ways that we're just sort of now starting to understand. Um, every one of us is wandering around with cells with um, our mother's genetic structure in them. And our mothers are all wandering around with cells that have our genetic structure in them. Um, and so those um, cells that have come off from us when we were in utero um, can have long-term effects. And some of this can have effects on how the body responds. And so each time you have a male offspring, you get uh, altered androgen levels. So more older brothers is associated with more masculinized digit ratios. And this is associated with sexual orientation. So you can see the more older brothers you have, the more likely um, you are to be uh, homosexual. Uh, a little bit true with uh, older sisters, but if you have younger brothers or younger sisters, you're much more likely to be heterosexual. <coughs> so this is one of those areas where birth order actually probably means something. Now keep in mind, of course, not every gay man has older brothers. Um, some gay men, as you can see, are, have younger brothers and younger sisters. And so this isn't everyone, but it's certainly a pattern that's worth uh, looking at. So what might be happening here is prenatal hormone exposure. So as we get these increased androgen levels, uh, we start to get uh, alterations in um, brain structure, uh, some sort of change over time. And this shows up in a variety of ways. Um, so prenatal hormone exposure may explain many of these effects, but none of these things that we've talked about, not genetics, not prenatal androgens, are true 100% of the time, which means that there's something else at play. So probably some of it is epigenetics, which we've talked about in previous lectures. So some gene environment interaction that alters protein expression and alters um, developmental trajectories or other interactions. So this is a very complex, sexuality is complex. Uh, and certainly when we start to talk about the underlying physiology of sexuality, it gets even more complex. So 
<coughs> to finish with uh, some additional information uh, on the prenatal androgen exposure hypothesis, um, there are studies that show that gay men have, uh, tend to have larger genitals, larger penises than uh, in some studies, but not all. Uh, but this would argue towards, uh, again, this increasing prenatal androgen levels, and penis size has actually been shown to be associated with that 2D40 ratio. Uh, lesbian women and gay men tend to have higher circulating androgen levels than their heterosexual counterparts. Uh, lesbian women tend to be better at visual spatial tasks than heterosexual women, again, arguing for this idea of alterations in androgen exposure. Um, <coughs> and all of this relates to the fact uh, that sexual orientation is primarily a biological phenomenon. This is not a social phenomenon. This is not a choice phenomenon. This is just simply the uh, natural uh, expression uh, of sexual orientation. And sexual orientation occurs throughout almost every species. Uh, alternative sexual orientations, homosexuality, occurs in nature all the time. And so this is simply a natural biological process at work. All right, thank you. And uh, next time we're going to talk about the reward pathway.